Alors avant d'accueillir Paul Seabright, on me demande de... de... Well, during this short break, may I share some piece of information? If you feel more comfortable uh, to listen to the French translation, don't hesitate. There are some headsets available at the back of the room. Or, moreover, questions will be asked in French. You can ask them on the chat uh, or via the QR code during uh, Paul's speech. Dear Paul. You've been in France uh, since uh, the year 2000, in Toulouse for about 10 years, since uh, you were the first uh, to lead uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, managed by Jean Tirole, and uh, that you define as follows. It's a parliamentary wing of TSE, that really uh, digs, digs into uh, multi-territorial uh, topics. Uh, so you are going uh, to uh, uh, narrate your experience uh, along the lines uh, of what has been planned, narratives that help people understand and accept the need of shared sacrifices. Dear Paul, your latest book uh, was dealing with the sex work. Next book will be dealing with the competition between religions uh, uh, to uh, enchant the world. We are really keen in listening to you and being taught how to become masochistic. Um, Stand between you and your lunch, so I will try to be short. I want to talk to you today about stories, not about graphs, not about statistics, not about budgets, not about action plans, but about stories, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell each other, the stories we tell our children, and importantly, the stories that our political and business leaders tell us. Sometimes when we are deep, we researchers in our research and in our teaching, we tell our students that uh, life is about uh, companies competing to sell us products and services. Much more than that, life is about competition to tell us stories. So around us, we have storytellers competing to provide their vision of the world. And sometimes we need to know how to decode those stories because it's not always obvious. To show that it's not always obvious, I'm gonna start with a picture. It's a rather strange picture. Um, it's a man in a suit carrying a briefcase but fighting a dragon. Now you probably think I intend this to symbolize Jean Tirole fighting off a particularly aggressive autograph hunter. And he certainly has to do a lot of that. But in fact, it symbolizes what most of our political and business leaders are telling us all the time. They're trying to tell us that they're competent, that they can wear a suit, that they can wear a tie, that they can carry a briefcase, that they can handle a spreadsheet, that they know what a budget is. But at the same time, they're doing much more than just managing. They're leading, and they're leading us in a struggle. So what I want to do is, in just a very few minutes, to help decode some of those stories about struggle and put us on our guard against some of the ways people try to slip messages into a story so that we don't know how strong and sometimes how dangerous those messages are. Now, narrative, which is the term that's used to describe all of the kinds of stories that people tell us has become fantastically popular in recent years. I recently did a Google trend search. You've probably done this where you look for a word and you see how it's been used uh, over time as a proportion of all the printed words that have ever been published. And it turns out that narrative in the last five or ten years has reached about twice the level of popularity in written discourse that it ever had before at its peak in the middle of the 19th century. Now, you probably think, if you've been listening to your, or you remember your literature teachers in, uh, in the lycée, uh, you probably think this is all about uh, your literary studies, talking about you know, postmodern uh, ways in which uh, stories are all about stories and not really about the real world. But no, economists have gotten in on the act. So here, 
No less distinguished a figure than Robert Schiller has a book called Narrative Economics. And by the way, he presented the first draft of this in a lecture in Toulouse a few years ago. In the latest issue of the American Economic Review, which was sent into my email inbox yesterday, of the nine articles published, three are about narratives. Two of them have narratives in the title, and the third is all about a particular narrative, which was a film called Birth of a Nation, which uh, went around the United States in 1915, and which the article shows was responsible for a significant and large rise in the incidence of uh, racial and other violent incidents. And so economists have really gotten into this. In fact, in some of my paranoid moments, I think that uh, narrative is all economists talk about. I mean, even Jean Tirole has a paper on narrative, so how much more respectable can you get than that? Whereas the literary scholars and the literary students all seem to be the ones doing critiques of capitalism. Anyway, I want to tell you something about what this study of narrative does. So I recently did a deep dive for a book I'm writing, which Vincent was kind enough to reference, about what the study of narrative, which is increasingly being conducted with uh, heavyweight statistics, what that study of narrative is telling us about what narratives do. So let's begin with what narratives are. Now, it might seem obvious, they're stories. But remember, stories aren't just any old list of events. Stories are particularly lists of events in a sequence. It's not always straightforwardly chronological. As you know, in good movies, you can have flashbacks. So the chronological sequence can be interrupted, but it's still a sequence. It still has a logic. And the stories are not just about the behavior of abstract forces. It's difficult to tell a story about the climate. That's why our ancestors told stories about climate gods. We may not believe in the climate gods anymore, but we still struggle to understand climate change as something which we can encapsulate in a story. So stories are chronological and they are about actors. Secondly, they have a structure. Okay, the structure involves particular sequences which make sense. So there's a beginning typically, a middle, there's an end. And importantly, events happen for a reason. Now many of us, if we look around the world, we see earthquakes, we see floods, we say, what's the reason? Well, we can come up with a scientific explanation for an earthquake, we know about plate tectonics, we know about floods, and we struggle to say, look, the floods may be the consequence of coming climate change. But why that flood there? Why that earthquake there? Why did those people have to die? We can't tell very convincing stories about that. But there are lots of other people who are willing to try to do so. So the fact that stories involve events that happen for a reason plugs very deep into the way we think, often deeper than we are conscious of. Stories have been studied for a long time. The first researchers who worked to bring together compendiums of folk tales were German researchers in the early 19th century, like the Brothers Grimm. And in the late 19th century, the Scottish anthropologist Sir James Fraser wrote a book called The Golden Bough about how all of mythology could be understood as having a certain structure. Now, Fraser's book was very popular, but the topic didn't really explode until the late 1940s when a man called Joseph Campbell published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which really said that all stories in all folklore were variations on one theme, which was the struggle of the hero. Now, Campbell infuriated people who'd already been working for years in the field of folklore studies and continues to infuriate them. When I went down the rabbit hole uh, researching this a few weeks ago, it was just extraordinary how many people have published articles in expressing their annoyance that Campbell's book had sold over a million copies while their articles were read respectfully about 23 people. 
But Campbell put on the map the idea that you can look at the different stories people tell you and you can understand their common themes. A few years later, somebody called Christopher Booker wrote a book called The Seven Basic Plots. And he said, well, there's not one story, there's seven, but they are sort of related. And as you can imagine, Booker's book also sold very many. And there is now a cottage industry devoted to arguing whether it's one plot or seven plots or 37 plots, which is the most interesting and elaborate version of the hypothesis so far. The point is that all of this work has been devoted to trying to understand what are the structures of the stories that people tell us, why do we see some stories regularly and not others, and importantly, what are these stories trying to tell us that lies below our conscious ability to understand and importantly to appraise them critically. Because one of the things about stories is that they can sell you a conclusion without you realizing how they've done so. So, here are the three big features I want to draw attention to about the role that narratives play in our social life. The first thing is that they capture our attention. You know, you, I, I'm sure it hasn't happened here, but once in a while you may be in a big meeting where your attention wanders. No? Nobody here? Well, I can assure you it does, and stories are a great way to hold that attention. Our colleague, Italian researcher Eliana LaFerrara, who was in Toulouse yesterday, has an absolutely wonderful paper showing that in Brazil, when the message of fertility reduction was packaged, not in a documentary television series, but in a soap opera, the areas where the television soap opera was first broadcast saw falls in fertility before the areas where it was broadcast later. And what that shows is not exactly that you can persuade people to do things through telling them a story, but that you can capture their attention through telling them a story. And then once their attention is captured, you can do various other things to persuade them. Relatedly, stories motivate us. And that's because of what I said earlier, which is that stories have a meaning. So if you're suffering, you can put up with your suffering because it has a point. I'm often uh, struck by the contrast between the terrible conditions of work in which uh, a number of people have to labor throughout their lives and the fact that those conditions of work are things that my kids, when they were working in low-paid restaurant work and so on, to save up to go backpacking in South America, were absolutely happy to do. They were prepared to put up with conditions that everybody else would have thought was inhumane because it had a point, because it would enable them to do something uh, very different and better later. And of course, that helps us to understand why somebody who is laboring in those same conditions but does not see a point will react very differently. So the motivation is really important. It comes from the structure of the stories that people tell us, and it comes from the fact that those stories show that pain and suffering has a point. Now, finally, those stories tap into ideas about fairness and about reward, about whether your actions and your benefits are justified or unjustified, that are not just the invention of a bunch of Greek philosophers living in the 5th and the 4th century BC. Maybe your literature teachers in the Lycée told you that, you know, these things are all human constructs, but they're not. They go far, far back earlier than that. They're deeply embedded in our primate brains. And that is not a metaphor. It is the literal truth. I am going to show you in a moment a video of a couple of primates. They're capuchin monkeys. Now, capuchin monkeys are not very closely related to human beings. They're not apes. They're quite distant from us in the primate line. And these capuchin monkeys were participants in an experiment by the primatologist Franz de Waal, who's also been to Toulouse and actually also showed this video to my colleagues. And it shows what happens when two capuchin monkeys take part in an experiment in which they are rewarded unequally. Let me hand over to Franz de Waal.
So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it, the other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Okay, so... Fairness concerns were not invented by Socrates, not unless Socrates was a capuchin monkey, all right? They're deep, deep, deep in our primate brains, and that means that stories that can evoke the passions in our primate brains have an enormous power to persuade. So three messages come through from the study of narratives. The first thing is that in successful narratives, reward comes after sacrifice, not before. Now, you know, from a point of view of an objective research scientist, you might say, well, who cares? You know, there's into each life some rain must fall, there's good stuff, there's bad stuff, maybe the good stuff comes first, maybe the bad stuff comes first. Why does it matter? I can tell you it really does. Endless experiments have now been performed in which you show people a sequence of events, and if the sequence of events has good things at the beginning and bad things at the end, they really don't like them. If they have bad things at the beginning and good things at the end, with the same amount of good and bad distributed through the story, they're much, much happier. There are a lot of other details, like the fact that it's better if the story speeds up towards the conclusion. If it slows down towards the conclusion, people don't like it. So the fact that reward comes after sacrifice really matters, and sometimes, there are narratives that fail to get that point. You've all seen pictures like this, and you will notice that what is written there is something about the d disappointment and anger felt by people who say, we have struggled all our lives, we were looking for the reward, now the reward is denied us. Now, you may think whatever you like about whether the president and the government won or lost the objective argument about the reform of the retraite. I have my own views on that, but that's not my purpose to uh, give you those views today. What's indisputable was that he lost the narrative, because in the streets, people had a more powerful narrative. They said, we're being given uh, the bad stuff at the end. And there is no way in which 
a narrative could have been succeeded unless it had been reframed in a way that allowed people to say the sacrifice comes first and the narrative uh, and the, the reward comes later. Maybe it would have been in terms of a reward for our children. We're very motivated by that. Not my business. I'm not a consultant on narratives. I'm just telling you what the research says and how it helps us to understand what is and is not going right in our societies. Second really important message. Sacrifice is acceptable only if it's shared. And it's shared in particular by the people who are competing to sell us the narratives. You will all have seen pictures like this. And most people who saw the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine expected, as the Americans expected, that President Volodymyr Zelensky would quickly leave Ukraine and direct the resistance effort from afar. Now think back to those capuchins and the grapes and the cucumbers. How would the Ukrainian people have responded if they'd felt that, yes, it might be efficient for President Zelensky to be directing the uh, fight from Berlin or Paris or New York, but he would have been getting the grapes they would have been getting something much worse than cucumbers. And the third thing, and the most difficult for us to absorb and to digest, is that sacrifice is needed because of an enemy. And enemies can't be easily conjured up from things like climate change. Climate change is not the right kind of enemy. And successful pol political entrepreneurs know about how to conjure enemies. Here is an infamous picture by the British politician Nigel Farage, which was um, pu widely published just before the Brexit referendum, in which he showed hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to get into Europe. One refugee is a sad figure. You can't fear them. 100,000 refugees are an enemy. Donald Trump, with a graph slightly less uh, pictorially evocative, also claimed that Syrian refugees were coming to overwhelm the United States. He also said of Mexicans that they're rapists, they're enemies. Okay, a very last thought. What's going to happen to narratives in the world of AI? AI is making it easier to generate narratives by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions. We live in a world in which people are competing to sell us stories. And the conditions of that competition have just got fiercer. Welcome to tomorrow, and I hope that the story is a motivating and inspiring one. Thank you for listening. Bravo, bravo, Paul. Um, nous reste quelques minutes. Thanks very much, Paul. We have got a few minutes left uh, with two or three questions. We consumption narrative has been and still is the most popular compared to uh, ecology narrative. Okay, so why is a capitalist and mass consumption narrative popular? I like the question, but I would reframe it slightly. Capitalism and mass consumption are not narratives. Capitalism and mass consumption are systems which are sold to us through narratives. And some of those narratives are very successful. You're all familiar with the uh, narrative in the United States, very popular in the late 19th century, thanks to the uh, sale in their millions of books about a character called Horatio Alger, who arrived as a, who uh, in, in who worked his way up from very humble beginnings to become a very rich man. And in the United States, it has been popular to think that it's the right of every individual person to work hard and be rewarded. And many uh, American manufacturers, for example, have turned those narratives into sophisticated ones about the way in which companies help people to do that. So the Ford Motor Company, based in Dearborn, Michigan, founded by Henry Ford, had a ceremony every summer in which they would invite all of the workers who had recently joined the company as immigrants from overseas. They would come in a big ceremony and they would jump into a large uh, contraption which was supposed to represent a pot in Marmite in French. 
which was called the melting pot, and they would wear their national costumes. They might be Greeks or Bulgarians or uh, Poles or, uh, or uh, Armenians. And a couple of minutes later, they would come out wearing business suits. And the whole exercise was supposed to symbolize that these people would arrive as immigrants from many different areas, and then through struggle, hard work, and of course, the beneficial guiding hand of the company, they would emerge as Americans, and not just as any old Americans, as very successful Americans. So let me, in other words, try to nuance that question by saying, don't think of capitalism, don't think of mass consumption as narratives. They're not, they're systems. But they're often sold by narratives, and we have to be conscious of what those narratives are. Now, some of those narratives are good. I mean, you could not have sold the story of Horatio Anja in the United States unless millions and millions of Americans genuinely benefited from the system. But I think the answer to the, the question is that all systems rely on successful narratives to be acceptable. And it's the job of politicians, it's the job of business leaders to find narratives that work. Alors, une autre question qui vient de nous arriver en ciblant des États-Unis. Si nous ne nous targetons pas nos ennemis, nous avons une approche binaire de la vision du monde. Donc, en ciblant des ennemis. Les ennemis ne nous conduisent pas à une vision binaire de la vision du monde. Oui, absolument. Et c'est exactement le problème que nous avons dans un monde où nous essayons d'obtenir des narratifs, nous essayons de narratifs qui nous donnent des narratifs. Nous essayons de vendre des narratifs that depend on the possibility of identifying an enemy, an external enemy such as an immigrant or some bad guy. How to respond to this? Well, above all, you have to try not to neglect it and just don't do as if nothing was the matter. Because there are entrepreneurs in the areas of politics or media, etc., who are going to try to sell the narrative and are going to succeed uh, at some point. Uh, if you try to just uh, pretend as if nothing was going to happen, we're going to lose the debate and probably lose the whole competition for a whole a nice vision, uh, healthy vision of the world. The major challenge for us is that the common good uh, is maybe to find a way of reconciling the differences uh, of our enemies. The common good consists in transforming maybe somebody who uh, presented as an enemy into a friend uh, instead of uh, the narrative of reconciliation from friend to f uh, from foe to friend. But you are uh, right. The person who asked the question, uh, it is very dangerous. But against the danger, the response is not to just uh, pretend it is not happening, but to uh, you know prepare yourself uh, for the fight and get ready. Um, uh, arm yourself. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the system of QR codes, uh, nonetheless, I want to thank the students who've worked on this. Uh, it's a very personal question. Uh, you're not a consultant in narratives, but I wanted to go back one second on the notion of reward after sacrifice, a reward after sacrifice. Let me take an example, uh, very familiar to me. Somebody who really loves uh, red meat uh, uh, and who's going to have a terrible time uh, doing away with uh, red meat and feeling very guilty about that love uh, uh, or uh, who uh, a person who lives in France but his grandchildren live in Mexico he wants to see the grandchildren but uh, he's wary of spending the, his whole CO2 quota uh, by in a single travel what kind of re reward did you propose in your narrative so that that person who'd renounce the pleasure of eating red Admit or traveling to Mexico? A very good question. Uh, I'm coming back from the Pyrenees where I spent five days in a, uh, a journey of uh, fasting and uh, trekking. So I know what it means to fast and I know the uh, narratives that you give yourself uh, all day long thinking about why am I doing this? What's going to be the reward? So 
Uh, first thing, uh, uh, so, you know, the taste of simple green things, when you haven't eaten for five days after fasting, uh, you have such a voluptuous desire to eat something that you haven't had the opportunity to eat for such a long time. Just green beans is like, wow. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, as an aside also, I did what uh, all narrative um, sellers uh, do. I transform. I didn't reply directly. I used that as an opportunity to tell my story. Uh, but to answer your question, indeed, I think that the notion of um, sacrifice, let's say sacrifice uh, in terms of consumption uh, for the future is something that we have to address in a different manner. Because if we tell all consumers that all of their uh, desires are guilty desires and that they should feel guilty about that, it's never going to work. Rather, I think we should propose uh, plans where by reducing their consumption of meat during a certain amount of time, they will have the right, they will avail themselves to the uh, right to eat uh, without the slightest uh, guilt, uh, uh, because life is beautiful. Uh, because some of my colleagues say, if they say, never ever eat meat, I will not agree with that because I shall not be able to follow that myself because I'm a meat lover. I'm trying to reduce my consumption of meat and what works for me uh, is reducing by uh, hoping to get a reward with joy, uh, celebration, uh, in the end. It is a perfect conclusion at 12 o'clock. Uh, uh, at 12.30, sorry. Thank you very much, Paul. And we'll meet again at 2.30. Uh, we're going to talk about inflation. Again, sacrifices.